Yes, sir. We got uh, 54 seconds. <laughs> You're good. Good morning. It's such a pleasure to see you all here. Those visitors who've joined us today, thank you. You encourage us by being here. I want to tell the members here, it's very encouraging to see you here as well. Uh, I think about Hebrews 10.25 where it says, you know, that we, by gathering together, provoke one another to love and good works. And, and I also have been thinking about Matthew 28, which, you know, when the disciples saw our risen Savior, uh, some were discouraged, but the things that he said encouraged them. And, you know, when he gave the commission to us to, to go out and teach all nations, to observe all things that he had taught, it was encouraging because they realized that really the Lord is going to be with us to the end. And that's the last few verses of Matthew 28 that I think about when we gather together because it's such an encouragement here. And if we you see something that we say or do that doesn't align with scriptures, come and talk to one of us. She'd be our friend to help us understand what we may have, have done that's uh, not right in your sight. And, and we want to talk about that always. Um, so it's just such a, a great and glorious uh, time that we have to serve our Lord and to be here this morning. I was thinking about the greatness, the magnitude of our Savior as I was walking and smelling the beautiful flowers on the way here, and it is such a, a joy just to be here today and serve Him. He is such an awesome God. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us the pleasure of being here to worship you. We ask that all these things we do today be in accordance with your will. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the mercy and grace that you've shown us. Help us as we strive to serve you better. Those sins that so easily beset us, help us to avoid those and help us to be strengthened that in the future we can be more perfect in your sight. Help us to grow in the word as we look to your word we search it to be obedient to you help it help us to be able to apply those things that we see from your word to our lives help us as we see others in need that we may fill those needs help us dear heavenly father to be able to serve one another as we look to you help us always to look to you and for the things that are in our lives that we're contemplating or we're concerned about, help us always to seek you first. And dear Heavenly Father, open your heart to be with us. Protect us as we serve you. Dear Heavenly Father, guide us and be, help us be wise in your word. Help us to seek deeper truth from your word and Help us to be able to realize those things that we need to do. Help us to also realize those things that we need to stop doing. And help us to have the strength to do those. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless our, our elders and our preachers here so, so that they may always do your will as you've instructed them. There's such an encouragement. And also the deacons... Uh, it's men like these that serve you, that strengthen us as we look to their example. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the greatest example, though our Savior, your Son, who was so willing to give his life for us and sacrifice himself that we might have that hope of one day being in heaven with you. Please go with us now through this service and help us to do all the things that you would have us to do here today through your son Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, good morning. Uh, I'd like to read Psalm 56 as we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper today. Um, the little subtitle under this uh, chapter says, A Psalm of David regarding the time the Philistines seized him in Gath. And, uh, and you'll be able to tell, you know, from this psalm why that, you know, that it makes a lot of sense. That that's the, the point in time that it's referring to. It says, O oh God, have mercy on me, for people are hounding me. My foes attack me all day long. I am constantly hounded by those who slander me, and many are boldly attacking me. I will put my trust in you. I praise God for what he has promised. I trust in God. So why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? They're always twisting what I say. They spend their days plotting to harm me. They come together to spy on me, watching my every step eager to kill me. Don't let them get away with their wickedness. In your anger, O oh God, bring them down. You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. My enemies will retreat when I call to you for help. This I know, God is on my side. I praise God for what he has promised. Yes, I praise the Lord for what he has promised. I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? I will fulfill my vows to you, O God, and, and will offer a sacrifice of thanks for your help. For you have rescued me from death. You have kept my feet from slipping, so now I can walk in your presence, O God, in your life-giving light. As I was reading this uh, about David, and I had been reading through 1 Samuel, and, and so there are many times in 1 Samuel, you'll see where David is, especially from Saul, uh, he's on the run. And, uh, and there are other Psalms that, that go along with this same mindset, that, that he looks to God for refuge. Uh, I, I need God to help me through these times. Because, I mean, remember how, quick, how close Saul was to killing David multiple times. And now here you've, you've got one referring to the Philistines who have surrounded him, who are attacking him, and he's afraid. Uh, and rightly, he should be, right? He should be afraid. They're trying to kill him. Um, he says, my foes attack me all day long. I'm constantly hounded by them. And I thought, you know, no one may be coming after my life, my physical life, my physical body to kill me. But I've got an enemy just like, Sa just like uh, David does, and that's Satan. I've got an enemy who is hounding me constantly, who is after me all the time who slanders me, and there's, you know, what it says is he watches, my enemies watch my every step. They're just waiting for me. They're looking at everything that I do. And I thought, you know what? I've got, I've got an enemy who's doing that exact same thing. And maybe instead of killing my body, what he's really trying to do is separate me from God and separate me from the love of Christ. That's what he's trying to do. Because if he can take my faith in God and my trust in God, push me just a little bit further away, then he's accomplished what he, what he set out to accomplish. And so I've got an enemy who's after me. You all have an enemy who is after you, just like David did. And that can be tough, and that can be scary. There's only one, only one way, only one way to overcome that. And that's believing in this sacrifice of Christ that God has provided for us. That's the only way that we're going to be able to escape Satan. And you notice what he says. He says, I praise God for what he has promised and think about what David was promised. He was promised the throne. He was going to be the king. He was anointed. He was going to be the next king, yet people were trying to kill him, and so he was worried about it. And if you recall, his best friend, Jonathan, at one point when Saul was chasing him, said, trust in God. Don't worry. My father Saul is not going to kill you because that's not God's will. You are going to be king. Trust in him. And so he encouraged him in that way. And I look at that for us as, as brothers and sisters. That's how we should be encouraging each other, no matter what you're going through in life. We need to trust in God and trust in the promise that he has made to us. And that's really why we're here, because everyone in this room trusts in the promise. And so when you have David saying something like, I praise God for what he has promised. Yes, I praise the Lord for what he has promised. In the end, what can anybody do to me? Nothing, because I know what God has promised me, and I have that, and here it is. So this is why we're here. We're here because, like David, we were promised something, and that promise was of a coming Savior. And there's even a further promise that everything that was accomplished in Christ in this horrendous uh, death that he suffered, and then raising up again, will actually result in our sanctification, that will result in a, a relationship with God where we will walk with him in the life-giving light that David talked about in that psalm. And there are a lot of similarities between us, but we are right here for that. 
there's a promise that God made us, and our, the very fact that we are present here uh, today to praise God for that and to say, yes, we believe in it, um, means a lot. And it means that we are pushing Satan away, pushing our enemy away, and we're here to praise him instead and thank him for what he's done. It certainly was a tremendous act of kindness and love and service to us who didn't at all deserve it. Um, but here we are praising God for the sacrifice of Christ. And so let's think about that, how, uh, how his sacrifice uh, really takes care of us, takes, takes care of our sin, and allows us to have the relationship with him that we need. Uh, let's pray. Our good Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you so much for your sacrifice of, of your son. Uh, that's such a big moment, and the biggest moment in all of history. And it was specifically meant to help save us from our sins and to bring us into the right, holy, and close relationship with you. We're so very thankful that he was willing to walk that road to the cross and die for us. We pray, Lord, now that you will bless this bread we're about to partake of and help us to always, in everything that we do, not just in this moment, but in all of our lives, to live to your praise and glory of his great sacrifice. In Christ's name, amen. Let's pray again for the cup. Our good Father, we're so very thankful again for this sacrifice. And we see as Christ's enemy, Satan, found a way to drain all the blood from his body, didn't realize that he was accomplishing exactly what you intended. For Christ's blood, your son's blood, to be shed for us so we could have forgiveness of sins. And Lord, we praise you so much for that. We pray you'll bless this cup that we partake of as we think of his sacrifice for us. In his name, amen. All right, we'd also like to take a moment um, to mention that uh, there are a couple of ways that we can give back to, uh, to God, really the things that are actually His. So maybe just giving Him some things that He's blessed us with, right? Um, he has blessed us so richly, which is, which is a wonderful thing. But whether God bl blesses us richly or blesses us just a little, uh, we should be willing to give to Him. Um, and so uh, let's, let's um, think about that. We do have a couple of ways that you can give. We have containers in the side that you can give in, or you could go with the Givelify app or drop something off of the building. Uh, but let's pray for a moment um, to thank God for what we've been blessed with. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we know that you've blessed us so much. But again, whether, whether we're blessed a lot or a little, uh, we are required to give to you and to um, give whatever we have to you um, so that we can continue on working in your kingdom, continue on blessing other people uh, in the name of Christ, and to be able to spread your word and, and help others to be able to find truth is such an important thing. We pray you'll help us to uh, have generous hearts and always have a, a, an outlook of generosity toward you and toward your work. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
see everybody today. Do you have a Bible this morning? The 21st division of John's gospel. John chapter 21 is where we are going today and we need you to open your Bible there. We're going to read some verses together that will not be on the screen. So if you'll grab a Bible and uh, be opening there, that will help you as we make our way through the material this morning. And while you're doing that, we welcome all of you. Thank you so much for being here today. Hope you have had a uh, wonderful week past and hope the week that lies ahead will be great for you as well. Glad that we can start off the week by being together, <clears throat> being together this morning. Those of you who are visiting with us via live stream today, we welcome you as well. Thanks for being with us and being a part of our church family today. And we hope that all the things that we do will help all of us as we study together this morning. It's good to see some folks making their way back to our assembly that have been, that have been out for a long time because of special circumstances that they have in their life with their health and then the COVID pandemic that is going on. And we have more and more, it seems like every week, that are now kind of making their way back to us. In particular, this morning, I'm glad to have the Delmans back with us. Now, Jim and uh, Big Jim had been back with us and Brenda once or twice before, but then a lot of those health things settled in, and we're glad that they're able to be out today. Hey, I want to say something. Those of you who are <clears throat> kind of longtime uh, folks in Tampa Bay, there are a couple of names that you'll recognize from their association with the school down the street. A lot of you will recognize the name of Don and Jean Cannavello, and uh, the Cannavellos were there for years and years and years, and uh, uh, Jean fell uh, and passed away from that. And so we know that some of you will remember them and know them, and we want you to <clears throat> be aware of that this morning. You know, at the other end of the spectrum, we look in our church family and we see a lot of folks that uh, good things have come uh, over the course of the pandemic. Some very difficult things have come their way. And then we get good news, like we did this week about uh, Christy McCormick, and about the uh, turn for the better that she took this week. And uh, we thank God for that and pray that that will continue, continue to be the case. We got another update last night about Christy, and uh, she continues in a good direction. And we're very, very thankful for that. And we pray that that will continue. All right. Well, let's get down to the business in hand <clears throat> this morning uh, in, the minutes, in the minutes that we have. I would imagine that probably several of you perhaps have seen or perhaps read the book that you see on the screen. Crucial Conserva Conversations has sold just over four million copies. It's a, it's a book that's influenced businesses <clears throat> and churches and families and individuals because it deals with a very important issue. It, it deals with effectively having conversations that nobody really wants to have. Conversations that once you have them can go very, very well or they can go very, 
very badly. Their conversations like the boss with an employee who really doesn't have much of a work ethic at all. Or by the other, by, on the other hand, the employee trying to talk to a boss who's been abusive to them in some way. Or maybe it's the elder in the church who's talking to somebody who's determined that they're going to do wrong instead of doing right. Or maybe it's the parent talking to a teenager who has definitely crossed the line and in attitude about that is defiant with them. And so those conversations are extraordinarily challenging. Sometimes it's husbands and wives. Husbands and wives who have to have that difficult conversation. Marjorie Kellogg wrote about families and said that there was a husband and wife who lived together for so many years that they mistook arguments for conversations. Can you imagine that? That'd be a terrible way to live, wouldn't it? I read this week, I read this week about a husband and wife who were having an argument and the wife said to her husband, when you die, when you die, I am going to dance on your grave. And the next day, the husband went out and made arrangements to be buried at sea. Think about that one for a minute. Yeah, some of you are going to get that on the way home today. Well, those are crucial conversations. They are difficult conversations. When it comes to the New Testament, the epitome of uncomfortable, difficult conversations occurred between Jesus Christ and the Apostle Peter. Now, they had several of those, as you are well aware. And so there is an occasion when Jesus declares that he is going to be crucified, and Peter confidently, boldly says to Jesus, you are wrong about that. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. That was a tough conversation that day. In the garden, Peter takes out his sword, and he is willing, in an act of great courage, he is willing to die for his Lord. And yet Jesus says to him, Peter, put the sword away. That's not what we're about, not what we're going to do right here. But the quintessential example is in the final page of John's gospel after the resurrection and just before the ascension. Now, John 21 makes it clear that this is the third time that Jesus has appeared to the disciples. So they've seen him before. Now, this is a special circumstance, and that circumstance really isn't our lesson, so we'll not go into that. You're good Bible students. You know, you know that <clears throat> what happens here basically is that from this episode, there come two very crucial conversations between Jesus and the Apostle Peter. Now, one of those conversations was about loyalty. When Jesus says, do you love me? And in fact, he said that three times. And that was the number of times that Peter denied him. And so that makes logical sense. It's very symmetrical in it, in, the, in its own way. And three times, Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, you're good Bible students, and you've heard in Bible classes and sermons that the English language doesn't always do justice to the word love. And so the first two times, the first two times that Jesus says, do you love me? He uses the word agape or agapeo. And we understand that. That's the word in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world. And you know that that is an unconditional, one directional love that is a matter of choice and not feeling. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me that way? And both times Peter responds by using the word phileo, which is I have tremendous affection for you. You are my friend. That's the way I see you. And the third time, Jesus uses that word with Peter. And I think sometimes we just kind of rush past that. But I think what Jesus is is saying to Peter is, you know what, Peter? I love you too in that way. I have that affection for you as well. I feel that way about you also. So that was a question about loyalty. And each of those times, Jesus says, Peter, I want, you to, <clears throat> I want you to shepherd my sheep. I want you to lead and feed and protect my people. And that's what Peter would do for the rest of his life. Now, the second conversation was about the future. It was about the future. And I want us to read in our Bibles a little bit here. Do you have your Bible open? Look at verse number 18 with me. So the conversation continues, and Jesus says to Peter, I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. Someone else will dress you, and they will lead you where you do not want to go. Now, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. So that's a prophecy about Peter's future and how he's going to die. You are going to stretch out your hands, just like you would stretch out your hands for somebody 
today in the 21st century to put handcuffs on you. He was going to be bound. And they will bring you to a place where you do not want to be. Now, we think that Peter was probably crucified after the fashion of Jesus. And so this is a prophecy about his death. And his death, Jesus says, he says, what a great vote of confidence. Peter, I know you're going to hang in there and do the right thing and stay loyal to me. And your death is going to glorify glorify God. He basically tells him how he's going to die. Would you want to know how you're going to die? I'm not sure about that. I've thought about that with this. Would you want to know how you're going to die? I would want to know only if it is that I'm going to die when I'm really, really old and I'm in perfectly good health, even though I'm old and I'm in my own house, in my own bed and surrounded by my family and they're singing hymns and I can hear the angel wings fluttering. That's the only one I want to know about. If I'm driving on the Pacific Coast Highway in California and go over the Bixby Bridge and am plummeting to my death, I just so not know about that. But Peter, he knows. He knows what's going to happen to him. And so Jesus says, this is what will happen. And he says, follow me. Now that's interesting because he said, Peter, I want you to follow me. It's going to be tough. You're going to be arrested. You're going to die at the hands of another, but I want you to follow me. But that's not the end of the story. So read with me, beginning in verse 20. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. <clears throat> this was the one who would lean back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked Jesus, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Now that's interesting because in verse 22, he says, look, that's really none of your business. I want you to take care of you. I want you to follow me. Uh, the contemporary English Bible phrases that, what difference does that make to you? Follow me. Philip's paraphrase of the Bible says, is that your business? You follow me. Now, I want you to think about that because that's the that's where we're going to <clears throat> work from today, where Jesus just says, look, John is a whole nother matter. And if I decide that I want him to live until I come again, really that doesn't alter anything for you. So don't be obsessed about what's going to happen to John. You take care of your own business and you follow me. I think that's a great question. What is that to you? And it's a great commission for us individually follow me. It's a great question and a great commission. And I want to use that to talk about two questions this morning that I think sometimes, sometimes as Christians, whether we're brand new baby Christians just learning to stand and walk or whether we're, whether we're really seasoned saints, I think there are two questions that sometimes we ask when Jesus, I think, would probably say the same thing. Well, you know what? That's probably not what you need to be concerned about. You just follow me. So let's talk about those two, and you tell me if that, that isn't correct. Here's the first. Here's the first. Why should I struggle while others are blessed? I think that's a question a lot of folks ask at some point in time. Probably everybody asks that at some point in time. Why should we struggle? I struggle while others are blessed. Now, the answer to that, by the way, is because you're a person of faith. And that really has two parts to it. The first is because you're a person, because you're a human being. And so Jesus said in the mountain message, the rain falls, God's rain falls on the just and on the unjust. Peter would say the same sufferings that you're enduring are endured and suffered by all your brotherhood in the world. And so the first answer is, look, you're going to struggle like everybody else. You're not a special case. Nobody gets out of this world unscathed. It just doesn't work that way. And so the first answer is because you're a person, but as a Christian, the second answer in that is, you're a person of faith. And so why should I struggle when others are blessed? Almost every Christian at some point in time has circumstances come in their life that they look at and they say, you know what, this doesn't seem right and doesn't seem fair. And you look at others, you look at people that don't honor God, don't think anything about God, they defy God, rebel against God, and they seem to be living a Teflon-coated life where nothing bad ever happens to them. And we look at that and we say, you know what, that's not right. So why should I hang in there? Why should I struggle? Why should I retain my faith and struggle 
when, <clears throat> when others seem to be so very blessed? Well, the answer is because you're a person of faith. Now, I want to I leave John's gospel for a minute, and I want to take you to the book of James. Because the book of James, in my estimation, deals with that very question. And it deals with it in every single chapter of the book. In many ways, James is a primer on the subject. Because James knows that when faith is really tried, faith really does work. In fact, one of the major themes in the little book of James is that there is a very practical way to tell whether or not we are living our faith when life is tough or if we're just mouthing words on Sunday. And so in every chapter, he talks about that. And I just kind of want to walk you through that. We're not going to take a lot of time, obviously. We can't do that this morning. But let me just walk you through James' answer to this question. Why struggle when others are blessed? Well, he's going he's to give an answer in every chapter. So let's just take a look at that as, as we go through it. In chapter 1, he says, you know what? Faith is proven by the way you deal, by the d- way you deal with your trials. Faith is proven by the way you deal with your trials. Dealing with difficulties, James would say, is not an elective in the life of a Christian. It is a required course. And so his book begins with these words. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And you, how, many, how many thousands of times have you heard that? That James doesn't say if, he says when. And that's an accurate observation, by the way. And so he says, look, this is, this is a required course for every Christian. You're going to have some difficulties. You're going to have some trials. And James says that trials put your faith on trial so that your family, your coworkers, your friends, they all find out whether Christian is just a name you wear or if it in fact is the person that you are. When suffering comes, James argues that Christians have a little different perspective about that. Because a Christian looks at that and says, you know what, if I can get through this with my faith intact, I'm going to come out on the better side and be a better person. And that's what he said in verse 4 of chapter 1. Let patience or endurance do its job, do its perfect work, and it will make you mature and complete and lacking in nothing. I read years ago a quote that said that Christians believe when they're in the fire that God's hand is on the thermostat. Now, that sounds kind of trite, but there's a lot of truth in that, isn't there? Because what did James say about our faith? He said, God will never allow us to be tempted beyond what we were able to bear. And so that's chapter one. In chapter two, he said, faith is proven by the way you treat all people. Well, why would that matter? Well, because when we're in trials, when life is difficult, when it's hard, when circumstances are rough, it's easy to become self-focused in the way that we deal with others and maybe to go and deal with them with prejudice or maybe arrogance. Why? Well, because when things are tough, we want someone to blame. That surely this isn't my fault. Surely I didn't put myself in this position. And so we look for someone else to blame. And so how do we treat others when times are tough? How do you treat somebody of a different race or of a different nation? Or just for that matter, a different region of our country? Maybe you've heard the illustration, the true story of Gandhi when he was a college student in South Africa, that he had read the New Testament in its entirety, and he was impressed with Jesus. And he decided to attend a Christian church. But when he went to attend on Sunday, a church that said it was following Jesus, he was told, you can't come in this church. There's a church for people of your color somewhere else. Go find it. And Gandhi said, quote, I decided then and there that if there, if there was a caste system in Christianity too, I may as well stay a Hindu. Well, of course, what we know is that that was never, never the way God designed that to be at all. In fact, James said in chapter 2, my brethren, don't, don't hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Can't do that. Cannot do that. Can't have a a racial uh, discrimination or national discrimination or even within the bounds of America, a regional discrimination. We just can't do that. And in fact, he would say in verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you will will love your neighbors 
love yourself. And he said, when you do that, <clears throat> you do well. So faith is proven, even in difficult circumstances, by the way we treat others. And then third, by the way that we control our tongue. Now, you know that in James chapter 3, you've got, the, you've got the greatest treaties in all the New Testament about a Christian and their use of words. We take, we take just two verses out of that long section there in verses 9 and 10, where James says, look, you know, sometimes with our tongues, with our mouth, we bless God and we curse others. And he said, that should never happen. That just should never, ever happen. And yet, we all know that hard times can sometimes produce very harsh words. Now, I guarantee you, if you're honest, I will guarantee you, if you're honest, you can think of a point in time when you were having a bad day, or you were having a bad month, or you were having a bad year, and you said something either to your mate, or a coworker, or your kids, or maybe you took it out on a server in a restaurant, or your, and you can fill in the blank there, because it was just a difficult, hard time. Let me ask you a question, ladies. Have you ever heard somebody, <clears throat> have you ever heard somebody absolutely shatter their Christian facade because they opened their mouth and spoke? James says that should never happen. And faith is proven in chapter 4 of the book by the way we contain our pride. Why is that a problem? You know why pride's a problem? Pride's a problem when things are difficult and we're being squeezed because everybody, we're, we're all trying to park in the same space. When you go, when you go to the mall at Christmas time and you're, and you're circling, you know, for the 20th time and you're just trying to find one parking space, that's all you want, just, just one, one space, one space. And <clears throat> somebody, you see, you see the taillights come on. What, what happens? Everybody in the world wants that one space. Everybody wants that one, that one space. Uh, I remember when I was in Italy one time, I, I was in the car with uh, Johnny Berdini and his wife Pina, and Pina was driving, and we were, we were trying to find a space in Italy. That's impossible. And she kept saying, die, 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 die. And I thought, well, that's kind of harsh. And then I learned that in Italian that means give, which would give a space, give me a space. But uh, probably most of us at Christmas at the mall of thought, die, die, die. We just, we just, we just want a space. But you, you know what? Nobody, nobody in this room got a memo this morning that today is all about you. It doesn't work that way. And so James in James 4, verses 1 through 11, he goes through a long litany of talk about that. And remember now, that the, that the book began in James 1 and verse 2 by saying, look, I know you're in difficult circumstances. I know you're enduring trials. This is a tough time. But when he gets to chapter 4 in the first 11 verses, the, the capstone of that really was in verse 10 when he said, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. And James lived that. In fact, James in this book will identify himself as James, slave of God, servant of Christ. And what he's saying in that is, and you and I know that he's going to die a martyr's death, that even then, as the brother of Jesus, he doesn't expect to be exempt from difficulties. And so he doesn't allow pride to get in the way and make him think, look, because I'm Jesus' brother, I should have special circumstances. He just doesn't do that. And so faith is proven by the way we contain our pride and finally, by the way we continue in prayer the way we continue in prayer. You see, faith really has to go to work <clears throat> when you get a not yet from God. You know, sometimes you pray to God and God says yes, and it's pretty clear that he's answered in the affirmative. Sometimes God says no, and sometimes God says not yet, not, not just yet. That's a tough answer. Now, James got that because some of the favorite words that he uses in this book are words like patience and endurance and maturity. You know the difference between an adult and a child? There, there are a lot. <clears throat> but but a, a child doesn't understand the words not yet, right? A child, when you say not yet, they think that means no. But an adult, when you say not yet, we understand through time and experience that not yet 
really means, well, hang in there, uh, keep contributing, keep working, keep going, and maybe something's going to good will come from this. When James is ending the book that began by saying, look, I, I know you're in tough times. He ends it by saying, I, I want you to be patient. He said, it's, he said, the, the day's coming, Lord's going to come and he's going to balance all the scales. <clears throat> and he said, it's kind of like a farmer plant seed, but didn't go out the next day and try to harvest. And then he'll use in James 5, two illustrations. One is Job, who went through extraordinarily difficult circumstances that he didn't really understand at all. And yet he retained his integrity and he never let go of God or his faith. And the other is Elijah, who spends three and a half years by a brook praying for circumstances to change. And James says, be like those two guys, be like those two men. What is that? It's saying that faith is proven by the way that you continue to pray. And so why should I struggle while others are blessed? Well, because you're a person, you're a human being, that's just going to come into your life. But more than that, because you're a person of faith. Now, that's really what I wanted to talk about this morning. I said there was a second question, but I'm, it's just going to take me a minute to talk about it. Here's the second question. And that is, why should I hang in when others bail out? Why should I hang in when others bail out? Now, that's a good question as well. And I think that's a question the Christians sometimes ask. Sometimes we ask, you know, sometimes people bail out on their faith. Why should I hang in? And the answer to that, by the way, is because you're a person of consistency, of consistency. I want you to listen carefully to me for just a couple of more minutes, and then we'll be finished this morning. I want you to listen to what I'm about to say very, very carefully. Declaration of faith is easy. The easiest thing you'll ever do is declare your faith. The demonstration of your faith is another matter entirely. I know that's true because James says that the demons have an impeccable, impressive theology. He said the demons believe that there is one God. Their theology is right about that. But he said the crucial question that we have to ask is this. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith alone save him? And the point of that is that faith should work. Faith should show itself genuine and authentic and real. Again, declaration of faith is easy. Demonstration of faith is another matter. Sometimes people think that others don't see them, but we do see. Everybody sees. I, sometimes we, we look at people, Christians, sadly, sometimes we look at Christians and it, it breaks our heart to see what we see. Sometimes we begin to see some of those telltale classic signs that passion is just fading. Uh, sometimes you see that by, you know, by, by a lack of being here, a lack of being together when they, when they could be with us and be together with us. Or sometimes it is people who are here, but they're not here while they're here. And you can tell, you can tell that as well. Or sometimes you see it in an, a change in attitude, an attitude adjustment, but the adjustment is going in the wrong direction. And you know that nothing good is going to come from that. Now I got to tell you, I think when we see that, it's so easy to be discouraged. And yet even in that, I think Jesus says, look, just like I said to Simon Peter, what is that to you? You follow me. You, you can't let that distract or discourage you. You follow me. It's interesting when Paul wrote to Timothy, he talked about that a lot. Timothy, I think, was challenged by this. I think Timothy was challenged by, you know, you, you read about Timothy and <clears throat> there was obviously some timidity about him and Paul had to address that. And I think one of the challenges he may have had was looking at people who had bailed out on their faith and thinking that maybe as, a, as an evangelist, as a minister, that he had failed them in some way. And so look at some of the contrast that Paul will use when he writes to him. He said, these also resist the truth. They will progress no further. Their following may manifest. But you, you have carefully followed my doctrine. And it's almost like he's, he's having to build him up a little bit. He said, look, don't be discouraged by those who are resisting truth and remember that you've been doing the right thing. And he pats him on the back for that, as it were. Here's, here's another place he does that in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He, he says, you know, evildoers and imposters, they're going to they're go from bad to worse. And, and they'll deceive, and they will be deceived. And that's horrible. It's terrible, tragic. 
tragic that they put themselves in that circumstance. But then he says, but as for you, you know, what, what is that to you? Well, it is something to you because you care about them and you care about their soul and you want them to be okay. But he says, make sure that you remember, as for you, you continue. You keep doing what's right. And he reminds him, you, you've known the scripture since you were a child. And the, those scriptures make you wise to salvation and nothing's changed in the scripture. And so you keep doing what is right. You know, when you look at those together, clearly Paul is saying, look, don't, don't let the actions of others distract you or discourage you to the point of not, to use his language, not continuing to do what God expects us to do. What is that to you? Now, again, that is something to us. In this circumstance, this is something to us because we care about the souls of others. And it breaks our heart when we see individuals in that circumstance. And so we have to do what we can do where we where we can. And so Paul would say, listen, we, we encourage you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. And so it is something to us in that way. It does matter to us to the point that we've got to do what we can. But when all's said and done, it's still, you, you follow me, regardless of what they do. Now, <clears throat> again, the quintessential example of that is it's just given in John chapter 6 because it's the best example because it's an inspired example that the Holy Spirit preserved for us. And you, you, you'll recognize this. This is John 6, that circumstance where from that time many of his disciples went back and they no longer followed him. And Jesus said, look, you don't want to leave too, do you? And Simon Peter, isn't that interesting? It's Simon Peter who answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so many turned back and no longer followed him. And it's Simon Peter who steps up, the same man to whom Jesus would say, you follow me. And here's the point. Jesus says, I want you to follow me. Even if others will not, even if others think it's not necessary, you follow me even when the road is long and tiring and lonesome. And you follow me in truth and you follow me in compassion toward the souls of others. And you follow me in forgiving and in serving and in holiness. And regardless of what anybody else on planet earth does, you follow me. And when you do that, he says, you will be an example to others. Now, I want you to listen just one more second. And so just, just listen. Don't put your stuff away just yet. Just listen. And I want to read to you. You don't need to open here. When you do that, when you do what he said, follow me. When you do it in spite of what anybody else in this world does, here's the result. 1 Timothy 4, Paul wrote to Timothy, beginning of verse 12, and listen to what he says. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Now, i got to tell you, we have a wrong view about that. We, we think young, and we think, we think teenagers. This is a Friday night teenage devotional verse. No, nah, Timothy, Timothy's probably, he's in his 30s here probably. He's talking to adults. He was a young adult, but he was an adult. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But as you, as for you, you set an example for the believers, for other Christians, in speech, in life, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and teaching. Don't neglect your gift given to you through the prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Now listen carefully. You be diligent in everything. Give yourself wholly to this so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. You follow me. Now, how about you this morning? You see that message of Jesus by the Sea of Galilee when he cooked breakfast for the disciples. And when he had that conversation as he walked along with Peter, it's still as valid today as it was that day. 
you follow me. And if that means this morning that you need to follow him on the waters of baptism, or if you need to come home to him today as his follower who's walked away, this invitation's for you. Let's stand. Let's sing. today. I just have two quick announcements for you, and then we'll have a song and prayer and we'll be dismissed. I want to first let you know, um, of course, that Christy McCormick has been, has been mentioned. She's doing much better and is improving day by day. Still very serious condition, but we're, we're happy to say that she's uh, looking better and better. Uh, I want to ask, of course, that you still be very careful about your communication with her. Um, I believe it's still the case that she has not been told about um, about her mother's situation. So please make sure you're careful about that when you reach out to Christy and, and let her know you're praying for her. Also want to let you know that in two weeks, oh, wow, that could have been bad. In two months, <laughs> we're going to have VBS. That's going to be uh, June 7th through 9th. So make sure you're ready for that. Make sure you're getting your kids ready for that. And if you want to help as a teacher, as an artist, as a crafter, as a helper in some way, you just send me an email and, uh, and I'll, make sure, I'll make sure I get you on the list to help. So we'd appreciate any help any of you could offer with regard to our VBS in two months. Uh, and we'll have, uh, that's all the announcements I have. We'll have a song and prayer be dismissed. Appreciate y'all singing this morning. Um, before we sing this last song, I just have one prayer request. Um, there's a young man who's, uh, who's at my home congregation. He's dealing with some side effects from uh, the coronavirus. Um, he's not doing too hot right now. He's, he's improving, but um, if you all just could keep him in your prayers. His name is Sean Stewart, um, and I would just really appreciate that on his behalf. So I appreciate that. Um, and we'll sing the Lord bless you and keep you. This is not the sevenfold amen, so we're all good. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, the Lord bless you and keep you. The share with one another. We're so grateful for this hour of worship. Uh, we're grateful uh, to be able to meet together and to remember Jesus, remember that he died for our sins, remember that we were bought at a price. Uh, Father, we uh, ask that you help us to take the things that we've learned today and to apply them to our lives. Uh, help us to be more faithful. Help us to remember uh, that when we're being tempted, uh, that that if we resist that temptation, uh, that will lead to 
perseverance, Lord. Help us to uh, be consistent as well uh, in what we do to uh, be like Jesus uh, in, uh, in, in what we say, in what we do, uh, how we deal with one another, how we encourage one another, Lord. Please uh, be with those who uh, are, are sick. Uh, help them to uh, get better, Lord. We ask that you lay your healing hand on them, help the doctors and nurses, and help us to do the best we can to encourage them. Uh, please be with us until we meet again. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.